So this week, we're going to be exploring some of the practical aspects of scientific advising. And indeed, it is a very challenging but uh, interesting time to be doing this uh, with what's going on in, in our country uh, with respect to challenges on environmental policy as well as, as well as within the state. So what we're going to cover is, uh, first of all, refresh your perspective on earlier discussions about what uh, role scientists play. We play multiple roles and we'll be examining some of them as the context for which we're giving advice. Secondly, uh, we're going to look a little bit more deeply at one of the ways, uh, very practical ways, uh, that we can hone our message uh, in improving uh, communication. Uh, we're going to touch briefly on the broader issues of scientific integrity, our responsibility to make sure that our science is well-founded and we're uh, following the rules, if you will, uh, also the rights uh, of, of that practice. And, <clears throat> and then also we're going to be examining uh, issues in the current climate, both in the nation and, and in the region, and some examples of the challenges that uh, environmental scientists now are facing. And then finally, uh, after we finish, after you re review this, uh, during, the, during the class period, we'll be doing some role playing, some exercises, some uh, hypothetical examples, and we're putting you on the spot uh, as, one of, as the actors in these plays. So just uh, rehashing what we covered earlier, uh, we, we know that we discussed uh, that, uh, that scientists play many roles. Here is the Roger Pielke's uh, Honest Broker image, and they can play roles as pure scientists, as issue advocates, uh, as science arbiters, and of course, this uh, idea that Pielke had of helping uh, decision makers walk through their choices as honest brokers. We also reviewed that scientists can have an influence through uh, epistemic communities, uh, groups of scientists who come together in uh, agree to certain things and cross political boundaries and have effects that way, but also as members of adv advocacy coalitions, uh, groups of folks, not only scientists, but uh, people in the agencies, uh, NGOs, and members of the public who basically share and communicate uh, towards certain ends. But I think fundamentally we have to recognize that science is, uh, is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions. So to be effective as a scientist in any one of these roles, even though that you might take a different approach and viewpoint, you really have to be uh, uh, respect and be consistent with that principle that it is a practice, that it is an enterprise that we work together with, whether on over time, that builds and organizes knowledge, and that we have to have uh, faith and, and emphasize things that are testable in terms of our ex explanations and predictions. So to communicate science most effectively, I want to introduce you to my friend, the message box. Uh, here, is, um, here is the report, which is uh, in the, in the uh, readings. It's, this one's a new uh, report. It's a fairly short, easy to understand. It's a workbook, really, so you can take your own experiences, your own projects that you're working on, and going through this to kind of hone your message, if you will. It's really a deceptively simple tool, but it is incredibly versatile. Uh, it can be oriented to a wide range of issues, not only in science and not only on the environment, but in life in many things in general. It can help you prepare for interviews with journalists. Do this before you pick up that phone and have that discussion with the journalist or an interview with employers. Uh, it helps you plan presentations to be more effective to getting to the bottom line. It helps you outline papers or talks that you're preparing and also in preparing proposals, compelling proposals that, and, and then finally, just to help you explain what you do to your family and friends. Uh, this concept of the message box is, box is used broadly. Uh, I once was at a congressional hearing and, and there was a representative of the offshore industry uh, doing acoustic surveying uh, and he had his little message box there before him that he or maybe with some help had prepared so he can stay on message in the answering the questions of the of the congressman but it is taught and used uh, with great effect by uh, Nancy Barron who is uh, has a journalistic background 
and has been working for an organization called Compass for many years, in which he's writing about this, but also having many, many courses and teaching about this all over the country and all over the world, for that matter. Full disclosure, I'm actually on the board of directors of Compass, but I'm very keen on this message box approach. So what does the message box help us do? It helps us uh, adapt our, our sort of state and traditional organization uh, of, of how we approach things as scientists to, to a way that people think about things uh, that they, that they uh, need to factor in scientific information about. And it also helps us think about a clear, simple language. So we all know that when we, we write a typical paper, uh, we have this tradition, the scientific organization, the title, abstract, you have to give a background, methods, results, discussion, conclusion. So, so that it really is front end loaded. If you watch, if you read many papers, there's an enormous amount of, of time spent doing this upfront material and often very little time spent doing the conclusions, which of course is what the rest of the world is uh, interested about. So the message box is an alternative way to organize your thoughts and your messages in which, um, we, as we'll see, we, we frame the issue based upon problems that it addressed. So what, is, what difference does it make? What are the solutions that it leads us to? And what are the benefits of those solutions? And the important thing about it is to keeping the language simple. Here are some interesting uh, reflective quotes uh, about the importance of simplicity of language. So this is the message box. Uh, you know, uh, what, we, what we need to do is frame, first of all, frame the issue. Uh, as we will describe it. And, and once you go through this, you do it uh, on the first cut, and then when you go back and look at that issue from the eyes of the outside world, the person you're speaking to, uh, uh, and frame the problems and, and the so what questions, it actually helps you reframe and redescribe the issues more effectively. So you go to issues, uh, what are the problems, uh, how does it affect people in the environment, what are you seeing that makes sh that you want to communicate, uh, then uh, addressing the so what question, why should anyone care? What is the importance of this? Uh, the solutions, well, okay, so you have an issue or a problem. How do, you, how do you propose to deal with it? And then what are the benefits uh, to the person you're giving the message to uh, that you um, have answered these questions and, and frame the solutions? So you can go to this uh, little workbook, work through it, read it, it's very simply written. And uh, as we'll go down the rest of the semester and you're framing your own projects, I would urge you to kind of take this message box approach in making your presentations. So the so what question, for example, in this message box approach, uh, it really depends on who to whom you're speaking. You know, who, who, who's the one who wants to know so what? What, is it, what does it mean to them? So you can see that the so what question may lead to different answers for policymakers for managers, for an environmental uh, or advocate group, uh, scientists is concerned about whether it's groundbreaking. It doesn't necessarily uh, worry about whether it's going to support any kind of political agenda. It shouldn't anyway. Uh, the media as it news uh, and so on. So again, the, the message is, con is context specific to the audience in which you're uh, addressing the message. So very briefly, uh, uh, this is a perfect time to reflect on the, the issues related, many issues surrounding scientific integrity. And I'm giving you a very short reading uh, from a summary of the EPA with respect to their environmental integrity, integrity, scientific, integrity, scientific integrity process. There's much out there. All the agencies now have, since 2010, uh, required to develop their own scientific integrity processes around a general federal framework, and and this is to ensure that the the, the that um, the integrity is results from the professional values that we share when conducting and applying uh, results to science to ensure objectivity, clarity, reproducibility, and utility. So the the very principles in which we're trained as uh, scientists. This scientific integrity issue is important because it provides we scientists from a bias, our own biases, biases of the particular group and organization we belong to, fabrication of data. Most institutions like uh, universities like our own have uh, rules related to scientific integrity, related to uh, honesty and fabrication of data, plagiarism and the like. 
It is also to guard against outside interference, political interference, and the scientific process, censorship, and inadequate uh, procedural and informational uh, security is, uh, is limited if we pay attention to scientific integrity. So this issue came up um, several years ago after uh, during the Bush administration, there was an attempt to kind of muzzle uh, scientists, particularly climate scientists, uh, some very distinguished scientists. And so as an outgrowth from that, it was intended to kind of set down the standards and approaches, but also to find some protection. So the guidance that the Obama administration put forth uh, speaks to the fact that we want federal scientists to be able to speak out to the media and to the public about scientific and, and technological matters based upon um, their own, their official work. This is, doesn't mean it protects them to speaking out generally about things in general or things that they haven't done, but their own work. Uh, and, but it requires that there be appropriate coordination with supervisors and public affairs office, the PR people, but in no circumstances may the public affairs um, officers ask or direct federal scientists to alter scientific findings. Now, at the same time, there's now, of course, with the changes uh, in this country, uh, emphasis on efforts to try to control that uh, and to make sure that regulations uh, and the like really have excessive amount of review and, and determination to kind of limit the power of science. This is, uh, and so you'll be waiting to see once we have a science advisor, the president hasn't even named one yet, uh, and begin to think about this administration's science policy. The degree to which the scientific integrity uh, uh, protocols and rules that, have been, that were developed in the last administration, how they change, it'll be interesting to see that. So we now are moving into uh, a, a different climate in this country. And you've heard uh, people mentioning, are we in, now moving into a post-truth world where truth, evidence really doesn't matter, uh, and that we're, um, you know, that we can shape that information to, to fit our, our political preferences in terms of outcomes. Uh, there's more emphasis on immediate economic interest uh, that are driving particularly environmental policy, uh, changes in environmental policy, right, as opposed to the long-term interest, the broader interest of society. Uh, that's manifest in the issues of denial of climate change, which you've seen and read so much about, I'm sure, uh, that's going on in this debate uh, in the country today. Uh, and what we see now is that we have, uh, certain people think we have an assault on science. That's why uh, people have organized, folks have organized this March for Science uh, in April. Uh, and there is definitely an assault on environmental protection by reversal of a variety of federal rules and regulations uh, designed to protect the environment. There are deep budget cuts. So you see here, you've probably uh, seen and heard about budget cuts proposed for uh, EPA and for NOAA, uh, and there are other agencies to follow, including uh, a, you know, a near elimination, 93% reduction of the Chesapeake Bay program funding, but also other regional uh, environmental programs and, ex and, and ex extensive cuts to uh, research and R&D uh, as well. So the challenge that we'll hopefully we'll be able to discuss uh, this week and then also in subsequent, uh, uh, subsequent discussions in this new world, how can scientists advise environmental management under these changing conditions uh, where we need to be able to speak truth and be brave, but also need to recognize that we don't want to get disinvited so that we aren't part of the process uh, to influence uh, public policy. So we're going to uh, review, and we've already talked about some of these current uh, controversies that, as examples of this. Uh, you may be familiar that just it took very little time for the administration and the new head of EPA uh, to withdraw the stream protection rule. This is the rule that was designed to keep uh, putting um, uh, waste and, and uh, material removed from strip mines into, st into streams uh, from coal mining areas. And then there is also this issue of reversal of the previous administration's position on waters of the U.S. What defines waterways that we can apply the Clean Water Act to? Does it also include things like irregularly flooded streams, uh, wetlands that 
uh, that are, are removed from navigable rivers, these sorts of things. And we've also seen, if you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind, if you haven't, statements and policy reversals on climate change. So I just submitted uh, this uh, Friday uh, an op-ed, we'll see if it's published, uh, in which I've taken a response to what the administrator of e uh, a new administrator of EPA said about uh, humans' effects on climate change. And I want you to read this because it basically, try, you may, hopefully you'll try to understand what role I'm playing which I'm not basically providing uh, any kind of an advocacy advocacy based position, but challenging the statement on the basis of its scientific uh, merits and in the evidence. And we've also, I think we've, I've mentioned this before, there are proposals to declassify Maryland's oyster sanctuaries. There were a very revised, now Waterman dominated uh, oyster advisory commission. And you can see that some of the changes that are being discussed here. And I offer just as an example of how I've tried to approach this anyway from a scientific uh, standpoint uh, of a letter uh, to uh, the chairs, uh, the co-chairs of the commission and the secretary of natural resources, raising some scientific questions, not taking a position, but raising some scientific questions, which should inform not only my, dis my position uh, as a commissioner, but other commissioners. Uh, and then we've discussed before this issue of termination of scientific staff in the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And in fact, there is going to be a joint um, and Senate House hearing on Monday, uh, March the 3rd, March the tw uh, 13th, I'm sorry, at 2.30. And I think if you go to the Maryland General Assembly website, there's a little section that has live hearings and you can probably click onto that. And if you miss it, you can actually go back and these, these uh, recordings uh, are archived. Be interesting to watch uh, that discussion. In addition, uh, this year in the Maryland General Assembly, there's legislation to provide a ban on fracking, uh, or if that fails, a moratorium. Uh, and there are questions, for example, for scientists who have worked on this. Some of our colleagues at the Appalachian Lab have uh, helped, been helpful to try to define best practices about fracking uh, if we're going to go ahead with fracking. So there's an interesting question is what is the, what, what is the limit of what those scientists should and say do because these positions about for or against fracking are usually based on many broader issues related to uh, concerns about fossil fuel dependence, concerns about economic development, property rights, and, and that are outside of the purview of our scientists. But what is the right, what is the appropriate role of our scientific advice giving under these circumstances? And then also there's one here with respect to way in the upper end of the bay at the mouth of the Susquehanna, the sediments that are built up in the dam. Uh, the current administration, Governor Hogan's administration, made various commitments and is very interested in dredging the sediments from behind the dam as a way to alleviate the problem of the dam filling uh, and therefore the, its transfer of more sediments and nutrients as the dam is filled. Uh, so they really are anxious and interested in going ahead and dredging, uh, dredging. So as an advisor, what is my role? What, I, what I've been doing is basically just raising questions, making sure they think through what are the implications, what are the criteria, what are the benefits, costs, these sorts of things as they move through it. So it's that time, just in closing, it's that time. You know, you know what I mean? Every year there is a international competition called Dance Your Dissertation. And if you haven't seen any of these, you should. So I would just to, for your entertainment and, uh, and perception, understanding of how the role that we have to communicate in this world, our science in this world, I would urge you to go to this particular uh, video. The, all of these are on YouTube. Uh, that this was the winner, international winner for the year 2015. And I chose it. But first, because it has to do with an issue that we're discussing. How, what is the role in science within a diverse society in framing environmental regulation? You'll see that portrayed uh, in this woman, uh, Florence Metz, I think her name is, uh, dissertation. Also, I, I uh, chose it to give you an example and inspiration because I just think she's a great dancer and also uh, has a great personality in her delivery of this. But you'll enjoy this. Please take a time, take a little time and go and watch this YouTube 
uh, a video of her dancing her dissertation.